What is that work that we call sanctification so that we say the Holy Spirit sanctifies me or Christ sanctifies me or the Apostle says through sanctification of the Spirit God chose us to salvation. What is sanctification? Sanctification is that work of God to break the ruling power of sin. Sin rules over man. Man never is independent. Man can never be his own creature. Man always is ruled by somebody. And man is ruled by sin, by nature. So that that sin has dominion over him. He must sin. And sin is a power of pollution. If you take a white cloth and you drag that through the mud, that mud is a power to pollute. So sin. Sin makes the sinner filthy. Sanctification is the act of God to cleanse the sinner from the filthiness of his sin. And that sanctification then is among all the saving works of God distinct. It is distinct from regeneration. Regeneration is the act of God to make you alive. You were dead and he makes you alive. Sanctification is to be distinguished from faith. Faith is the act of God to implant you into Jesus Christ. Yes, I said that faith is the act of God. Sanctification is to be distinguished from conversion, which is the act of God to turn the sinner from sin to the living God. Sanctification is to be distinguished from justification, which is the act of God to forgive the sinner his sins and to impute unto the sinner of Jesus the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is God's act to free or break the ruling power of sin and to cleanse the sinner from the pollution of sin. But now I want to simplify. When you think of the salvation of God that he gives to you, God appointed you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. Really, you have to only remember two works. There are really only two great works of God in your salvation. They are works of God. They are holy works of God. And they're two distinct works. The first work of God to save you is the work of God to justify you. That's the work of God that changes your state. Every human being has a state. And that state is his position before God in light of the law. What does the law say about him? Is he guilty or not guilty? That's your state. There are only two states. There's the state of guilt and there's the state of not guilt. If you are guilty, you must be damned. If you are not guilty, you must be saved. Justification is the act of God to change your state. By nature, your state is guilt, and God says, you're not guilty. It's simply a verdict. God says, I forgive your sins, and your sins are forgiven. God says, I don't hold you accountable for anything that you've ever done in your life. I'll never punish you for them. God says, I impute unto you the righteousness of Jesus Christ, so that you are perfectly righteous in my sight, that justification is wholly the act of God, wholly based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What matters in justification is not your works. Justification is not by works. I frankly don't care if you sin or you don't sin. I don't care if you obey or you don't obey. Don't talk to me about what you do. Justification, it's about what Christ did. Christ obeyed the law of God. Christ loved God. Christ loved his neighbor. And he did it for me. God says, that's yours. That's how I see you. That's how you have to think of yourself with justification. You have to think, uh, God, sees God, in, or God sees Christ in me. That's how perfect I am. I don't have any sin. I never sinned. And I never will sin. I'm perfect. 
And that justification is by faith only. And that means by your not doing. Justification is by not doing. And by faith only means that justification is by Christ and what Christ has done. And that justification, then being God's act to forgive your sins and to declare you righteous, that is how then God treats you. God treats you on the basis of that verdict. God loves the righteous. God blesses the righteous. God dwells with the righteous. God saves the righteous. God does good to the righteous. And by justification, we are righteous. And that one whom God justifies is ungodly. He has no good works. He never will have any good works. He is always and forever an ungodly one. That's the first great work of God. And you have to understand that is your salvation. God says you are righteous, you are saved. You are perfect in His sight. And now following from that is the other great work of God. It's the great work of God for our sanctification. You can include all the other benefits, regeneration, conversion, sanctification, under one name, sanctification. It's all one great work of God to regenerate you, to convert you, to sanctify you. It's all one great work. It's the great work of God to change your condition. Your condition is your state or your mode of being. It's, it's how you are. It's what you think, it's what you love, it's what you do. Your condition. Your state is the position before the law. That God changes by justification. Your condition is who you are. Who are you? And by nature, you're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sins. By nature, you are far from God. By nature, you walk in the way of unrighteousness. By nature, as the apostle says, you have pleasure in that unrighteousness. By nature, you are far away, walking away from God. And God must change your condition. He must make you a different kind of person. And God does that, first of all, by regeneration. Regeneration is God's act to make you alive. You were dead and now God makes you alive. And then following from that is conversion. You were walking away from God and God turns you to Him. Belonging to that then is God's consecration of you to Himself. He draws you to Himself. He separates you from sin and sinfulness. He separates you from the world. He makes you his people. Or, as Scripture says, He makes you a saint. Sanctification changes our condition. Changes our condition so that we can say, I am a sinner. And according to sanctification, we can say, I am a saint. It changes our condition in the very root of or depth of our being. It changes our condition in our heart. He says, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's not our pleasure anymore, according to God's work of sanctification. Our pleasure is not in unrighteousness. There is a pleasure for unrighteousness in your flesh. Absolutely. Your flesh, all your flesh likes, is unrighteousness. Not in your heart. In heart, you love the Lord your God. In sanctification, God changes our condition. That work of sanctification, according to the text, is rooted in election. 
God chose you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. When I say it's rooted in election, you must understand what I mean by that. Rooted in election does not mean that in eternity, God said, I am going to sanctify them at some point in time. When I say rooted in election, I mean this. In eternity, you are perfectly sanctified. Let me say this to you. In eternity, you are more sanctified than you are now. In eternity, you are more sanctified than you are now. Because in eternity, your sanctification is perfect. In eternity, God beholds the end. In eternity, God sees what He's going to make of you. Not now. Now you can't see that. John says that, beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be. Of course it doesn't. If you look inside you, you're not going to see sanctification. I don't look inside yourself to see sanctification. You're not going to see it. You're going to see sin. You're going to see lust. You're going to see unrighteousness. In eternity, however, sanctification is perfect. And it is, when I say it's rooted in eternity, I mean this. It is that living will of God for your sanctification that explains what he does to you now. He wills that you be perfect. He wills that you be wholly consecrated to him with all your being, not just in your heart, with all your being, so that in your nails and in your hands and in your hair and in your ears and eyes and nose, and with the very blood that courses through your veins, with your muscles and with your mind and will, you are sanctified to God. You love Him. That's what He wills. And according to that eternal will, you could say this, it is the power of the immutable will of God that sanctifies you. Isn't that true according to the text? Through sanctification of the Spirit. The Spirit is God. I know He's the Spirit of Jesus Christ, but the Spirit is God. God the Spirit in eternity willed your sanctification, and God the Spirit in time carries out His eternal will. That's the root of your sanctification. It doesn't have anything to do with your works. And that sanctification was accomplished at the cross. At the cross, you were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ so that that blood cleansed you from all pollution. And that blood broke Satan's power. That's what Christ himself said. Now is Satan cast out. The cross sanctified you. That cross, as that cross was the product of the living will of God, God's will for your sanctification brought that cross into being. God said, Let there be a cross that they might be sanctified. And at that cross, he sanctified us. You are more sanctified at the cross than you are now. Because the cross purchased perfect sanctification. And that sanctification is wrought in you by the Spirit of the living God comes to you and he takes up his abode in you and he rules and reigns in your heart 
and he wars against sin. He frees you from its dominion. He washes you from its pollution. And he consecrates you by his own power to the living God. And in that light, we must speak of works. I can define good works too theologically. Good works are those deeds of love toward God and the neighbor that proceed from a true faith that are done according to the law of God and that are performed for the glory of God. Or I can very simply define good works as acts of true love toward God and the neighbor. I want to say this, we do good works. You do and I do. But that's not the point. That's what's being made the point. If I can explain that by way of emphasis, the point is this. We do good works. We do good works. It's all about man. And that doing of man, that doing of the good work, is the completion of sanctification. Sanctification is not complete. God can work in your heart by the Spirit uh, to break sin's power. They wouldn't say that. God works in your heart to cleanse you from sin's pollution. God enables you by the Spirit to do good works, but sanctification is not complete. Until you do the good work, sanctification is not realized in you until you do the good work. You are the one who is in the doing of the work, your own sanctifier. We do good works. I wouldn't point them out about myself. I will let Christ do that in the final judgment. We do good work. But that's not the point. That we do them. The point is this that there are good works. Such is the power of the sanctification of the Spirit. Such is the power of the living God when He takes His abode in you that a human being does good works. That's shocking. That's astounding. The emphasis isn't on the human being. Oh, look at this human being who does a good work. The emphasis is on the fact that out of God's work of sanctification, in the power of that sanctification, comes this good work. That's astounding. When you say sanctification and good works, sanctification is not God's part, and good works are your part, that complete sanctification. Sanctification is God's work, and the good works are God's work. It's all about God. And a man does his works. That's true. He must do them. Absolutely, man must do good works. You must do good works. I must do good works. So emphatic is that must. That it is impossible that you not do good works. It is an absolute inevitability that you do good works. When they teach the must of the law, it's a possibility. You must do good works, you must do good works, you must do good works, you must do good works. Well, I don't want to do good works. And so I don't. In fact, the more you tell me I must do good works, the more I don't want to do them. Isn't the preacher saying you must? 
It isn't even the must as that must comes through that preacher. It isn't the law. You must not have an idol. You must not have a law, uh, an image. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. It's not that law that makes you do the good work. There's no power in the law for its own fulfillment. The law is a weak and beggarly thing. The law is weak in that that law cannot make you do it. And that law is beggarly because the law has no reward or riches to give you for doing it. The power of the good work is the spirit of the living Lord. The spirit that you have through the gospel and not through the law. Doesn't the apostle said that? This, this happened to you, he said, according to our gospel. He didn't sanctify them by the law. He didn't come preaching Moses. He came preaching Jesus Christ as the yea and amen of all of God's promises. By faith they received the Spirit. And by the power of that Spirit they were sanctified. The must. Good works isn't you. Uh, the must of good works even isn't, isn't even you enabled. The must isn't you with grace. That's not the must. The must of good works is God. First of all, the must of good works is God's eternal decree. The Apostle Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 2, which he before ordained that we should walk in them. You must walk in good works. And you will walk in every good work. You will not miss one good work that God ordained that you walk in. You will walk in every good work that he appointed you to. Everyone, you must. And the must of that good works is according to that eternal will of God. The must of good works is the Spirit in you. The same one who appointed you to the works. He is God. He appointed you to all those good works. That's His will. And he fulfills that. He works that in you. And the must of good works is the cross of Jesus Christ. You must walk in all the works that he bought for you by his own blood. That's what, that's what Paul says to the, to the Christians in Titus. He redeemed unto himself a people, purified them, zealous of good works. That's, that's rooting all of the holy life of the people in the cross. And the must of good works is the Spirit's own work of sanctification. It's an utter, it's an inconceivable thing that those whom God justifies, those whom God sanctifies, not walk in every work God appointed to them. So that we say good works are the fruit of sanctification. I hesitate to say only fruit. I don't like that. They are fruit. That's beautiful. Only can lend itself. I know what's meant by that. That's all they are. That's all they ever will be. But that doesn't minimize them. They are fruit. That's, that's shocking. That there be fruit. You were dead trees. Dead branches. Utterly worthless. You didn't produce any fruit. 
And if you did bear any fruit, it was completely bitter, poisonous. There's no fruit in us. There's no life in us. Because we're of Adam. And when we're cut out of Adam, and we're engrafted into Jesus Christ, the Spirit makes life to abound. They're fruit. Fruit and only fruit. But the only means, that's all they're ever going to be, but what they are is fruit, and that's beautiful. We were dead trees, dead branches. And because I know all those things, because I know you must work, I know that God appointed you to good works, I know that Christ bought you good works, I know you have the Spirit in you, then I can tell you, now do good works. And I'm not leaving that up to you. I'm not saying you must do good works, now you need to decide to do that. I'm not saying you must do good works, and now you have to realize your own sanctification and do those works. You must do good works because God appointed you to them. Christ bought them. The Spirit is in you. And you will. And that, that reality of sanctification wherein you are made a saint, made a saint without any works. You may never think I'm a saint because I do works. That's not why. You're a saint because the Spirit took his abode in you. He made you a member of Christ. He cleansed you. That's why you're a saint. And because you are a saint, you do good works. There's no good works necessary for, for sanctification. Proof of that? You want proof of that? A baby. Everyone who has brought their baby for baptism, according to the reform form, has said that he believes that his baby is totally depraved in Adam and sanctified in Christ. How many works does a baby have? And that's the same thing Christ taught when Christ, rebuking the cruel theology of his disciples, who said you have to do works to come to God. You have to be, do works in order to be near unto Jesus. They were saying that because they told the parents, get your babies away. Get your babies away. They did that out of their false theology of works. Jesus says, don't forbid them. Such is the kingdom of God. They didn't have any works. No works at all. All they had were demerits. The demerits of Adam. And of them was God's kingdom. They were near unto God. They made up the citizenry of the kingdom of God. They had no works. And they were saints. Sanctification is not by work. Sanctification is by faith alone. That's what Peter says. Acts 15. There was a big controversy in the church about works. And whether the Gentiles had to do works. Don't say it was just about the law of Moses. It was about works. And Peter said in Acts 15... And God put no difference between us and them, the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Not by words. He purified their hearts by faith. He cleansed them from dead works to serve the living God by faith. By faith only. And that faith, when we say by faith only, really what we mean is this. By Christ. You're sanctified by Christ. 
And you're sanctified by Christ through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And only because He sanctifies you do then works proceed out of that. Sanctification bears fruit. And now I must return briefly to our text. There are many works that you will perform, but this is the greatest. The love of the truth. He brings up sanctification in connection with the love of the truth. He doesn't say, I thank my God that he sanctified you so you could build some houses. He doesn't even say, I thank my God that he sanctified you so you could love your wife, so you could love your husband, so that you could teach your children. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that because the truth is all. And the love of the truth sometimes demands the hatred of father and mother and sister and brother and spouse too. That you hate them because you love the truth. That's the great, all-controlling work of the Spirit in you. That they had pleasure in unrighteousness was made manifest by what they did with the truth. And what we do with the truth is the sure evidence of our sanctification. The truth, the truth, the truth. Because the truth is over all. And you don't love it. Not in your flesh. When the truth says you must give up your spouse, you say, I hate that truth. When the truth comes and breaks up your Christmas parties, you say, I hate that truth. When the truth comes, the truth says you must forsake your father and your mother and your sister and your brother and you must hate them. Then you say, shut the truth up. I don't want to hear it anymore. Because in our flesh, we hate the truth. And you only come to it. You only leave father, mother, and sister and brother through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. He comes into you who by nature hate the truth. And he changes your heart. He takes his abode in you so you can't do anything else. So that when all your flesh and all your acquaintances are crying out against that, you say, but I love the truth. That's the great work of sanctification. And everything else in life flows out of that. He gives us the love of the truth. And because he does, you're safe. You'll never leave. I know that. You'll never leave. You'll never turn on the truth. You'll never hate it. You'll never crucify its prophets and throw them out. And when the truth, which has demanded so much, demands your life, you'll put your head on the block. I know that. I know that with absolute certainty. You may doubt it, but I know it. You'll never leave the truth. We're never leaving the truth. I will never 
leave the truth. The whole world be damned. Because thank God, He chose us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Thank you. Let's sing to conclude the night. 426, 426. Let's sing stanzas one, oh, one, five, seven, nine, and ten. Remember that? One, five, seven, nine, and ten. Are there any questions? All right, then. Yes. I'm not going to quibble with the term. Can sanctification be considered progressive? I'm not going to quibble with the term. And I don't like to quibble about terms if I don't have to. 
Sanctification is not progressive in the sense that it is used in the Protestant Reformed churches. The Protestant Reformed churches, progressive sanctification was epitomized by the false teaching of Reverend John Marcus in Edmonton. I dealt with his preaching both as a committee member and as a member of classes. The condemnation of his preaching of progressive sanctification that was made in Classis West stands in the judgment of God. It was overturned by Classis West in which Classis West revealed itself to be unrighteous and shot through with false doctrine and respective persons. The doctrine of progressive sanctification taught by Reverend Marcus and defended, I might add, by every single Protestant Reformed professor and virtually every single Protestant Reformed minister and all of the delegates of Classist East, save two that I know of, that doctrine was this, that by virtue of man's works or efforts, he grows in his sanctification. By which word sanctification, they meant the principle in our heart. So that in me, my heart is in principle sanctified and then by my works that grows. And I become more sanctified in my heart, more holy by virtue of my works and efforts. That I reject categorically. If by progressive sanctification we simply mean this, that throughout my life, through the work of the Holy Spirit, I become more aware of my sin, I become more grief-stricken over that sin, I see that sin uh, more readily, I long more and more to walk in holiness, I long more and more to be in heaven, then absolutely sanctification is progressive. That is, as that principle in my heart is manifested in my whole life, that must grow. Sanctification in that sense is never perfect in this life, but uh, grows as it manifests itself in my hatred of sin and my love of righteousness. I can say that about myself. Now, doing theology from experience is always a precarious thing. But I can say about myself, I know my sin more. I hate my sin more. I want heaven more. At this point in my life, I can say that if the Lord took me tonight, I wouldn't argue with him. Earlier in my life, I probably would have argued with him that I need more time. That's growth and sanctification. So if we want to call that progressive, fine. I would stay away from the term because of the false doctrine that is associated with it. I think that term now has become polluted. Any other questions? The judgment of synod was that in 2018 that we're forgiven the wrong place of salvation. Could you expound on how that was done and what that means and then also give us a brief summary of what is the proper place of visit in salvation? The question is that Synod 2018, which by the way, as everybody knows, of my position on Synod 2018. Synod 2018 was the devil's decision. It was a wicked, godless, and harmful decision. It even had too much truth in it for the Protestant Reformed churches, so they jettisoned it as quickly as they can, and they don't believe that decision any longer. Never did. They never believed it, even in its weak form. 
But the decision that matters now in the Protestant Reformed Churches is Synod 2020, which said that there are activities of man that precede blessings of God. That is the summary of the doctrine of the Protestant Reformed Churches, and that is the official dogma of the Protestant Reformed Churches. But the question is, Synod 2018 said, falsely and lying through its teeth, that works were given a wrong place in salvation. Could I expound on that, how that was done, and then explain the right place of works in salvation? Lying, Synod 2018 said, that works were given the wrong place in salvation. The wrong place that works were given in salvation was clearly demonstrated in the protests of the Protestants, Neil Meyer and Connie Meyer and others, that Reverend Overway of Hope Church gave to works a place in obtaining the assurance and hope of salvation, of garnering a greater experience of God's fellowship, and therefore he gave to them a place in the sinner's justification. Reverend Overway taught justification by works. Anybody who sat under his preaching, I had the distinct displeasure of having to listen to some of his sermons, but anybody who listened to his preaching, it crushed them. It was wicked, godless, viperish, destructive preaching. And I hate it. It nearly destroyed loved ones. And the church that I grew up in, it did destroy. And it was so wicked because it taught works in justification. Whenever works have a part in obtaining for you or assuring you of your assurance, in the nonsense that they say today, they assure you of your assurance, Whenever works have some role in that, getting you experience or getting you comfort or getting you assurance, you're dealing with justification. And you also will perish if you believe that. You'll perish first in your own soul because you will have no comfort and you'll perish eternally under the judgment of God as an offense to him as an unbeliever in the gospel. What is the proper place of works in salvation? Works have absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. Nothing whatsoever. Salvation means to be saved. It's wholly passive. Every aspect of salvation, absolutely every aspect, we are passive. That's what salvation means. You are saved. You are regenerated, you are given faith, you are converted, you are justified, you are sanctified, you are glorified, you are preserved. It's all passive. Works have nothing to do with salvation. Nothing whatsoever. You are not saved by works, you are not saved through works, you are not saved in the way of works. Works are the fruits. And now, only the fruits the fruits of salvation. He purifies to himself a people. That's salvation. He redeems a people. That's salvation. Who are zealous of good works, the fruit of all of the saving work of God in us is a people who love to love God, love the neighbor. Did I answer that? But I want to reiterate that point. Senate 2018, I hate that decision. I hate it with all my heart. It angers me when it's brought up as some measure the truth. It was not the truth. It was as devilish as they come. That decision was taken to destroy a denomination, and it did. And everyone who voted for it, including me, must repent for that. I was fooled. I said to myself, when that decision came out, 
And I spoke against it. And I said, this is weak. I should have said, this is wicked. Then I said to myself, this is all we can get. This is all we can drag across the line. Maybe God being merciful, he'll spare us. But I voted for a wicked decision. And I know that now. I hate that decision. You'll never find it on my lips as anything even approximating the truth. It was a strong delusion that God cast upon the churches in order that many be damned. Are there any other questions? The hour is long. Yes. Because the hatred of the brother is not malice or uh, have anything ungodly about it. The hatred of the brother is a refusal to tolerate his sin and departure from the truth, and therefore a refusal to be quiet in the face of that departure from the truth or wickedness so that you rebuke it. That's hatred. I hate it. And if he holds it, I hate him too as an offense to God. Not with malice in my heart, but I'm not putting up with his false doctrine, I'm not putting up with his, his wicked way of life. That's why when you preach the antithesis in families, if you have family members that, that hate the truth, you, you don't have them over for dinner. Well, they say this, if you have them over for dinner, it's going to be a very unpleasant dinner. If I have over a family member for dinner who doesn't believe the truth, I'm not shutting up about the truth or the fact that they're wrong and they need to repent. And they're going to flee out of my house and they'll never come back. That's the hatred of the, the brother. And I love him when I do that. I love his soul. I love his salvation. There's no greater love that you can show and when you lay down your life for the brother by rebuking him for his sin because he will hate you for it, you very rarely do die, but you show great love and no one may call it anything else. Everybody wants to talk about evangelism today. You've got to do evangelism, you've got to do evangelism, you've got to do witnessing, witnessing. I'd say this to them, start in your own family. Are there any other questions, comments? All right, then let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy truth and for the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth, out of which that love of the truth comes. Sanctify that truth in our hearts, Father that we may love it and forsake all for it and that we might hold it in humility and that we might war with it, a great warfare. For we have now entered into a great contest, a contest that will consume us to the rest of our lives and never let that contest grow cold or grow old that we may zealously take up the sword and contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. Use this conference, Lord, for our refreshment. We give thanks, as did the apostle, for the brethren. The brethren who love the truth and who come to it 
We are, Lord, a strange band brought together by thy grace and spirit, made one. And keep all malice and unkindness and squabbling over worthless things out of our midst that in the truth we may love one another with a pure heart and fervently. Father, pardon all our sins. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.